In 2018, I made a video called Top 10 Video Games I've Played in 2017. Since I don't tend to play a bunch of games released in that year, I can't really make a video called Top 10 Games of 2017, but I still wanted a video series to have an excuse to talk about some of my favorite games that I've played that year. I actually had one planned for Top 10 Video Games I've Played in 2018 and 2019, and I prepared a list for the games I've played in 2020. However, procrastination got in the way, so I never got around to doing them. So since it's the start of the year, I think it's Fair enough to say that I can start rolling these out now just because well I still want excuses to talk about some of my favorite games of a year even though that year was three years ago anyway with that being said I'll go to the script that I wrote like three years ago oh man it's that time of the year again the time to look back at all the games that I've played whether they have been new releases or older and pre-existing games that I haven't yet played until this year this is a video that basically acts as an excuse for me to talk about games that I just really liked playing this year or well three years ago so hopefully you guys will enjoy this opinionated mess of emotions I will be using the same rules as last time and I'll be adding some new ones too rule number one I can only pick games that I have played from October 2007 to December 2018 I count October 2017 because it's like the last three months of the year so it's fine rule number two is I can only put a game that I haven't played before so if I replayed a game such as Super Paper Mario then it wouldn't count and lastly I can only pick one game per series this is just so I can give everything a chance and diversify the list a little I am going to remove the rule where I have to beat a game to put it on the list because I honestly didn't really complete all too many games that year. But yeah, the criteria has been set, so let's begin my top 10 video games that I've played in 2018. Number 10 it's really funny to see how this series is now at the bottom of this list, especially since I've been praising Rune Factory 3 to death. But first we have Rune Factory Tides of Destiny. Tides of Destiny is one of the Rune Factory console games, the other being Frontier. The reason I put this one on the list rather than all the other Rune Factory games I've played is because of the characters in this game. To me, they have this charming feel to them, which... I didn't bother elaborating on. I'm not saying that the other games don't have any charming characters, but this game in particular had characters that just spoke to me. For example, there's the three sisters Odette, Lily, and Violet, who all work at an inn that you, the main character, stay in. Each of them have such a charming and lovable aspect to them, one being clumsy, the other being a bad cook, and the others being leagues above the others. Okay, um, maybe I'm being a little biased here. <laughs> The overall atmosphere of the game is really neat too. The structure of all the buildings and stuff is really nice to look at. The plot's actually pretty neat. You play as a boy named Aiden, or you can name him, sure, that too I guess, who shares a body with his childhood friend Sonya. Sonja. Pronunciation is up in the air. And at the same time it looks like you've been warped to the future. But that's really all that interested me with the game? The game progresses really slowly, making it feel like sometimes you aren't making any progress at all. The farming mechanic is extremely confusing, tedious, and just plain unnecessary. And while the combat does feel a lot smoother in this game, it doesn't help that half of the time there's so many enemies that sometimes you're trying to do a sick air combo, but you get kicked out of your combo by some damn chicken! A lot of the core parts of Rune Factory gameplay is changed, and it just makes the experience really weird. The farming islands in this game are laid out really oddly, and you don't plant crops in a grid-based format. And instead, you need to wave a wand in order to plant crops, and only your monsters can tend to those crops. The plants are randomly selected depending on what type of monster you tame, but they will only grow that one plant once you tame them. For example, I really wanted emery flowers, I wonder why, and one of the monsters I can tame actually can plant those types of flowers. Unfortunately, mine just happened to plant moondrums only, and the only way to change this is to increase their friendship points. I don't know why they overcomplicated one of the simplest gimmicks to their franchise, but I digress. Some other issues are story points being quest based, so you have to choose to commit to a story quest or a bulletin board help request, cause you can't do both unfortunately, and to cancel one to do the other means you have to start over from the beginning. The dungeon layout is also really weird. You have a swarm of enemies and tons of monster gates right off the bat, and it takes you a really long time to deal with the single enemy, making dungeon crawling a little bit of a drag. There's also the new method of traveling across the map, with your goal. In exchange for time, you can fast travel, in quotation marks, to a certain location in the world, or walk there yourself if you hate your free time. You can also encounter enemies on the map, but so far the battle system has been kind of lackluster. While there's a lot of really weird issues with the game, besides all that, it's a pretty fun time. The farming system is a little difficult to grasp at first, and the enemy distribution is a lot, but it's a really cool console Rune Factory experience with a different set of relatively fun characters. I really want to give this game more of a chance with how much I love the franchise, so I might make a video of my thoughts of the game in the future. So with that being said, let's move on to number 9. 
Number 9! I feel really guilty for putting this game so low because this game is so much fun. I was so excited to get into WarioWare. I got a glimpse of the cutscenes for this game and I got hooked on all the various different characters. Ashley, Dr. Krygor, 9Volt, and of course, my menu. <laughs> this joke is so fucking bad. Oh my- I put this in? But what is WarioWare? Well, in short, it's considered to be a tech demo that is meant to test the capabilities of the console with fun minigames that you have to complete in a very short amount of time. The story mode is a blast to play through with four different categories of minigames. The first type being fantasy, minigames based off of stuff like princes and princesses and magic. Nintendo classics, minigames based off of certain Nintendo games. That's life, minigames about... Okay, I have no idea what this category is. And sports, minigames based off of various sport activities. On top of that, there are four ways to play these minigames. Mash, a control setup where you use the D-pad and or the A button to complete minigames. Touch, where you use your stylus. Twist, where you utilize the built-in gyro controls. And Blow, where you use the microphone situated in the strangest places on the freaking console. On top of the main story campaign, there's a bunch of side content you can play with, such as little minigames, phone calls, and obviously the best feature, dubbing the cutscenes with your awesome voice. The only reason this game is so low on the list is because there's only so much you can do, besides beating your high score on a bunch of the minigames. But that's only if you're playing alone. Now I honestly just pull the game out as a fun party game to play with family, which even then is a blast, passing the system around as people try to complete a minigame quickly. Regardless, this is definitely worth a play, and if you haven't gotten into WarioWare yet, this is the definitive version to play hands down. More than 300 microgames including remastered versions of past microgames, side content and tons of challenges, as well as a wacky cast of fun characters? Sign me up! Number 8 Kirby's back in his newest entry, Star Allies. An evil presence invades planet Popstar, where the Chaos Heart from Super Paper Mario comes and provides steroids to even the fattest of penguins. I had some concerns with this title in terms of content, so I waited until Black Friday to get a neat sale on the title. With all the free updates that came with the game, I'd say the game is definitely worth buying, and even then, the game was a pretty fun experience overall. Sure, the gameplay might be a tad bit easy... really easy too easy? I still found myself having a blast with this title, despite not being that challenging. Though it's a Kirby game, I mean, it's just supposed to be mindless fun. The main game is also pretty short, but there's a couple other side modes that can keep you company. There's Heroes from Another Dimension where you- okay, but for real, I just bought this game because I thought Flamberge was cool. Shoutouts to Flamberge. The Ultimate Choice, which is just the arena renamed. And then Guest Star Question Mark Question Mark Question Mark Question Mark Star Allies Go, which is an extra mode where you can play as all the friends in the game. It's pretty cool. And then there are small little mini games like Chop Champs, where you have to chop down as many logs as you can under a time limit while avoiding worms. Overall, Kirby Star Allies is a pretty good time. The main campaign is a little short, but it has a lot of modes for replayability value, and I think we should just get more games with Flamberge. Number 7. At first, it was the Super Mario Odyssey before Super Mario Odyssey. Little did we know that this little indie title would become one of the creams of the crops from 2017. A Hat in Time is, as the game calls itself, a cute as heck platformer. It stars Hat Kid, a small little child in her huge spaceship to get home, but unfortunately, something goes awry and causes her fuel source, the time pieces, to fly away. It's up to you to help Hat Kid and recover all the lost time pieces to help her return home. The entire atmosphere of this game is great. Its characters are charming, its dialogue is hilarious, the art style is, well, cute as heck, and the worlds are also colorful. The gameplay as well felt very clean, movement, platforming, and all. The level design is super fun, and I enjoyed playing every level. Except the Vanessa one. God, not that one. A Hat in Time succeeded in standing out as one of my favorite 3D platformers to date, and with all the mods for the game, I'm glad to say I'll have a lot more fun playing even more of what A Hat in Time has to offer. Number 6. Wait. Can this game even count? So I recently picked up Super Mario 64 speedrunning and I'm having a blast with it. Learning all the glitches and movement options and watching my PB get faster and faster and streaming every moment of it. Wow, that was a plug. Huh. While I really should someday sit down and play Super Mario 64 in its entirety, speedrunning this game has been one of the most enjoyable things I've done this year. There's nothing else to add really. Super Mario 64 is a classic 3D platformer that revolutionized gaming in its era and has stood the test of time to this day. I'm glad I was able to finally play Super Mario 64. Even though it's just in 40 minutes. Sub 30 minute PB hype? Oh, this was before I actually hit that. Huh. Number 5. I'm gonna be real with you, I didn't like Sun and Moon all that much. It was okay, but to me it felt like it was missing something. But this game has blown Sun and Moon out of the water for me. 
While this game is, to the bone, just Sun and Moon, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are able to differentiate itself to be the new reincarnation of the third game. You know Crystal, Emerald, and Platinum? This game is kinda like that. It fixed some of the problems of its predecessor and added a slight twist in the story, while keeping the core story and gameplay nearly identical. And I gotta say, this game did a pretty good job at that. I'm a huge sucker for small little things, like mini cutscenes when Nurse Joy decides it's time to take a break, and even the smallest of changes was enough to make me love Alola for real. Overall, I feel like Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon did a decent job at improving its predecessor's mistakes, just like a third game should, but at the same time, I feel like it added a couple more problems. They didn't fix how hand-holdy the game was, and a lot of the game just felt like cutscene! Gameplay. Cutscene! Gameplay. Cutscene! And there's the argument that the story really cut a lot of the characters' arcs in half, such as Gladion, and while I can't really help but agree, there's also some really cool moments that add more depth, like that one side plot with Musumin's character for one. The criticism for this game is definitely valid though. It feels more like a third game among the ranks of Emerald and Crystal, or in this case, third and fourth. The sequel, than a sequel, due to it fixing some general problems the previous games had and added a little bit of spice to it. But I'm pretty sure people, myself included, were expecting something more of the lines of Black and White 2, which also makes sense. Despite all that, even after playing Sun, I found Ultra Moon to be a very enjoyable experience. I'm just weird like that. Number 4 So Fire Emblem Fates introduced me to Fire Emblem. Say what you will, but as time went on and I got pretty broken by my third goddamn Rebecca before she got nerfed to the 3 to 4 star pool, I decided it was finally time to play another Fire Emblem game. I picked up Shadows of Valentia for a bit, but all the maps kinda dragged on and on, and I kept procrastinating to the point where I still haven't finished Alm's first act. But that one time I saw Fire Emblem Awakening on the used shelf in EB Games, I knew I had to get it. This game was an emotional roller coaster to me. I did not think I could get so invested in something. A lot of the characters were really colorful, the others being Vake, that one mage, and yeah, that's about it. The story was probably one of my favorite parts of the game. Well, yeah, it's not perfect, it was enough to get me extremely invested. Building up my units to become Super Beast was really fun too, but I guess a little bit unbalanced, you could say. I didn't pick any optimal strats, so they weren't that overpowered, but still. Robin's sick. Awakening's gameplay overall was pretty fun. The maps were pretty good, soundtrack was nice, story was engaging, and oh, oh, fuck it. SUPPORT SYSTEM FOR LIFE, BABY! Since Awakening was the last attempt at bringing back Fire Emblem from the dead before it stays dead forever, whether the fact that Awakening succeeded being a good thing, I guess, is up to you. They pulled out a lot of stops in making this a great return to the franchise. Lots of links to the first few Fire Emblem characters such as Marth and Tiki, and it was able to make its own unique story out of it. Two of them, actually. Fire Emblem Awakening was an extremely enjoyable experience and satisfying from beginning to end. Very excited for Three Houses to see how well it holds up now. Number 3 Forwards Breath of the Wild I hammed on this game like crazy, being skeptical about the new take and basing my expectations off of a dumb demo at Toys R Us. Then I decided to pick it up. I didn't regret it. Breath of the Wild is an extremely magical experience, which let me explore the remains of Hyrule after the terror that was Calamity Ganon. If I were to summarize my Breath of the Wild experience, it would be a true adventure. This game was the long adventure that I had been longing for, and the gameplay fit that to a T. Everything felt so free, fun, and it didn't feel like it cut any corners. Wanna fight this Bokoblin camp? Make sure you can take it, after all, that blue guy looks pretty scary! I didn't want to use a guide for this game, I just wanted to explore the world and let the story come to me. I kept walking and walking, and if a special story event triggered, then I would just go along with it just like a true adventure. I was in awe with what I could do with Breath of the Wild, and the atmosphere that the game built itself around. I'd be here forever if I had to explain everything that I liked about Breath of the Wild, so I'll stop here and talk about my gripes with the game. For one, the lack of story was a bit unfortunate for me. There were some small little bits and snips of lore and cutscenes that filled the player in on what happened in the last 100 years, but the world still felt empty. While there was so much to do in the game, at the same time, there wasn't. And the DLC was fun, but it didn't really fill in the emptiness the game seemed to have. Editors note, the video is being made after the announcement of Breath of the Wild 2, so I'll put some final words here. I hope they're able to fix those issues in the sequel, but at the same time keep that wonder of adventure that I felt when exploring Hyrule in Breath of the Wild 1. Also, <laughs> Zelda butt. <laughs> Why the f*** did I add that?! <laughs> Number 2 
You knew it was gonna be on the list. The most hyped up game of the year, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, was one of the biggest games of this year. It was announced in 2018, released in 2018, and didn't get delayed like the last two games. Everyone is here and nobody got cut. We got some new faces and some fan favorites. We got Ridley and K. Rool, some Inkling here, some Banjo there, and some... Incinera DECIDUATE NO! I'm having an absolute blast with Ultimate. The gameplay is exciting and fast, the small quality of life changes like set rule sets improve the game a ton, and the roster is also expansive and fun. Nobody feels terrible or downright bad. Except Sheik. World of Light was... Nah. I found myself bored of it super quickly and then decided... The main theme isn't that bad. The online buffer and delay is also an issue for me, and a lot of people too, I guess. Depending on who you fight, sometimes things can get a tad bit tedious. Yes, you with the Kmart Wi-Fi who's currently on Elite Smash right now with Bowser. That means you too. With the constant updates to the game like new balance patches, Sheik, are you kidding me? And new and returning modes such as stage builder and online tournaments, it just adds to Ultimate's charm, and I'm always looking forward to what else the game has to offer for me in the future. And even with the existing modes and the base game like a unique classic mode route for each character, it just shows the amount of love and effort put into this game on a Sheik. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is a fun time with friends, and alone too if you're that type of person. The CPUs can now destroy everything you love if you're not careful, so they're actually pretty decent for practice at times. Ledrol. 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 Okay, maybe not. But hey, they had to nerf the CPUs in their very first update. That's how good they were. Nonetheless, the game is pretty fun for casual and competitive players alike. Hey, uh, another 2021 Scrags note. From what I can see, I've updated the script a lot in the past couple of years, and every single time I've rewritten the script, uh, I'm very disappointed that I didn't mention Squad Strike. That mode is really fun. Uh, you know, maybe they should uh, put it online. <laughs> also, there's obviously like a bunch more gripes with the game. Online still an issue. Buffer still sucks. In neutral, everything feels really safe looking at it in a competitive way. But yeah, I think Ultimate's still a pretty fun game, all things considered. So yeah, let's move on to the next game. Number one. I don't even know what the hell is Toohoo. Whatever it is, must suck. Well, time sure does change a person. I had someone recommend the game to me, and as a Pokemon person, I do have to say it caught my interest. And I held it. What I experienced was a true ride of joy, sadness, and torture. A fresh take on the Pokemon formula, rewriting and redefining it to truly make it its own. And it's an anime girl RPG. Toho Puppet Dance Performance is a fan game heavily inspired by Pokemon, but instead of collecting your favorite Pokemon, you can collect your favorite Toho characters. As puppets. I should probably add that part too, yeah. Explore the region of Gensokyo as you familiarize yourself with a new storyline, new characters, new type matchups, and of course, the puppets. I think the best part about this game was that it was just like playing Pokemon again for the very first time. Going through a brand new adventure with no idea what to expect, and just going with the ride. You didn't know what was optimal, you just found the mons you thought looked cool and built an army with those six mons you carried with you to the end. There are some pretty interesting changes made to the Pokemon formula to fit more with the Toho feel. Instead of gyms, there are boss trainers, extremely strong puppet masters that are built to give you the worst damn time of your life. You will be stuck with most of these for quite a while, but that's the magic of it. The game is hard, but it's not stupid hard. There is an actual challenge to the game, kind of like... The Dark Souls of Pokemon? No, no, okay, I'm not making that joke. Seriously though, the game is more challenging and fun than just, okay, here's a really stupid mod that walls you out, and good luck. Sure, it gets frustrating at times, but you know you can do it. The story isn't mind-blowing, but it sure was a blast playing through it. Nothing at the level of To The Moon or the Sonic Adventure 2 fandom, but it's a good time for a Toho fan. The art is pretty good too, with the overworld giving you that classic Pokemon feel, and the major characters getting some neat full art during their dialogue. The soundtrack for this game is absolutely stunning. Remixes of familiar Toho themes with a Pokemon-like feel is a blast to listen to, and it captures the atmosphere and scenery as a whole. Here are some of my favorites.
interact with the characters, grow your team, and relive Pokemon all over again, but with a twist. If you're a Pokemon fan looking for something new, and you don't mind this, then definitely give this one a whirl. If you like Toho and Pokemon, then also give this game a try. It's definitely an experience I'll never forget, and it's probably one of my top 5 games of all time. Or just watch my Shard of Dreams playthrough. That's pretty cool. So, those were my top 10 picks of the year. This video came out a lot later than I wanted it to be due to school and other projects, but I do hope you liked the video anyway. Maybe I inspired you to try and play one of these games. Let me know which ones you're interested in in the comments below, and I want to see your top 10 games of 2018. If you can remember them at least. Or just whatever you're playing right now that you like. I like reading the comments. If you want to see more content from me, you can check out the Shard of Dreams playthrough I mentioned, or if you want to check out some more scripted content from me, I have a PVG Space hamster S video where I talk about a bootleg Mario Kart game, Kokoda Kart Racer. It's got glitches!